This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. Hello and welcome to episode 73 of the Thousand and One Movies podcast. Based on the book, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die. This week, I'll be talking about Wanda, the 1970 independent film written and directed by Barbara Loden. Not have anything. Never did have anything, never will have anything. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. You don't want anything, you won't have anything. You don't have anything, you're nothing. Man, you won't be dead. You're not even a citizen of the United States. You've probably never heard of Barbara Loden, only the second of two female directors in all of the films covered thus far on this podcast. Born in 1932 to a poor working class family in Ohio, Loden ran away to New York with her musician boyfriend at the age of 17 and worked as a dancer at the Copacabana as well as a pinup model. She married her first husband, Larry Joachim, in the 1950s. Shortly afterward, fate dealt her a winning hand when she met Elia Kazan, famous for directing movies like On the Waterfront and A Streetcar Named Desire. Despite the fact that they were both married to other people, Loden and Kazan carried on an affair until their respective divorces and their eventual marriage in 1967. Loden had gone from a wide-eyed and naive girl from the Midwest to a scantily clad cast member of the Ernie Kovac show, to being married to Hollywood royalty. Although she had won a Tony for her portrayal of a fictionalized Marilyn Monroe in 1964's After the Fall, written by Arthur Miller, Monroe's husband, and also played Warren Beatty's sister in 1961's Splendor in the Grass, Loden hadn't quite made a huge impression on audiences and many of those in her husband's circle considered her not much more than his trophy wife. Exactly how and why Loden was inspired to make Wanda is a mystery. One story is that in 1966, while on safari, she was offered $100,000 by producer Harry Schuster to make a movie. Other sources state that after writing Wanda, She spent six years trying to find funds to make the movie. I suspect that the truth is somewhere in between, as Loden would undoubtedly have used her husband's influence to get money. No matter where she got the cash, Loden found inspiration in a newspaper story about one Wanda Goronsky, a working-class Polish woman who was sentenced to prison for her involvement in a bank robbery and who allegedly thanked the judge after the trial. The simple plot of Wanda belies its complexity, and since the film is very difficult to find, I'm going to break precedent by describing the plot in detail. Loden plays Wanda, a woman from a Pennsylvania coal mining town who is divorced by her husband and subsequently spends a lot of time frequently bars and being promiscuous. She soon meets the enigmatic and perpetually grouchy Norman Dennis, played by Michael Higgins, and the two go on a road trip, stealing and cheating their way across the state. The climax comes when the two stage a bank robbery in which Norman is shot and Wanda sneaks away. She returns to the small town she came from, and the film ends on a shot of her in a bar, a cigarette drooping from her mouth as she stares down into her beer. If this sounds like a retelling of Bonnie and Clyde, nothing could be further from the truth. Loden would later state in an interview that she wrote the script ten years before Arthur Penn made Bonnie and Clyde, and that her story was a more realistic tale, emphasizing that Penn's story had unrealistic characters who would never commit the crimes that they did in the film. Loden shot Wanda in ten weeks with the help of cinematographer and editor Nicholas Proferis. Only three actors were used, Loden herself, Michael Higgins, and Valerie Memche, who plays the roadhouse hostess in the final scene. 
All of the remaining cast were non-actors, plucked from filming locations in and around Pennsylvania. While the film's function as a type of autobiography is questionable, it is interesting that Loden had Michael Higgins wear all clothes that belonged to her director husband. Did Loden intend for Norman Dennis to represent Elia Kazan? For Kazan's sake, hopefully not. <clears throat> the film appeared in a single theater in New York with no publicity, and it was quickly forgotten. However, it became a critical hit in Europe, and won the International Critics Prize at the 1970 Venice Film Festival. Although no one had heard of the picture in America, it was something of a cult favorite in France where a print would be screened here and there. The film's failure probably damaged Loden, who had put so much of herself into it, and she never made another film again and died of cancer in 1980 at the age of 48. According to her husband, she died angry. After Loden's death, French filmmaker Marguerite Duras pledged to distribute the film so that it could be seen by a wider audience. This never happened. It took 20 years for the movie to see daylight again, when French actress Isabelle Huppert took steps to distribute the film. Eventually, American audiences were able to see the film on DVD. What did I think of Wanda? Back in episode 42, I talked about how Les Samurai was an American noir film made like a European film. Wanda is an American character drama also made like a European film. It's a classic example of cinema verite, with its long shots of people doing ordinary things, sparse dialogue, and documentary feel. It was made on 16mm and subsequently blown up to 35mm, which enhances this documentary feeling. Frankly, the history of the film and its director are more fascinating than its plot for me, which goes from slow and plotting to paradoxical. Wanda seems attached to Norman Dennis, yet he abuses her at every opportunity. In one scene, he violently smacks her across the face after she gets his hamburger order wrong, and later there is an uncomfortable moment when he fondles her while he's driving. I enjoy films in which we know next to nothing of the main character's background, and this is one of those films. However, when she appears in divorce court late, in curlers, and nonchalantly agrees to a divorce, and then spends the next few scenes in bars and picking up men, it's a little difficult to feel sympathetic for her. Nevertheless, she is literally the only person in the film who has the slightest bit of decency. Norman Dennis is an angry crook who uses her, there is a nameless man who bails after sleeping with her, and even her ex-husband has his issues. He introduces his girlfriend to the family court judge, explaining that he'll marry her because someone, quote, needs to take care of the kids. All this being said, the film obviously struck a chord with women like Dura and Huppert who longed for it to be seen more widely. This is because the film is about a broken woman, a woman who is forced to press the reset button on her life after giving it a try outside her hometown. Indeed, the final scene of Wanda staring waywardly into her drink expresses just how disparaged she had become. The film is also important in that, although it was a labor of love by a woman who was a blonde bombshell among Hollywood elite, the character she portrays in it is nothing but. Barbara Loden no doubt had her own questions about herself. Did she need Elia Kazan to be successful? Did she need men at all? Do women in general need men at all, aside from the need to procreate? Watching Wanda, one would think the answers to these questions is no. Academically, all of this is very scintillating, but for anyone whose interest in cinema is purely escapist, they would be sorely disappointed in this film. I even found myself looking at the clock after the first 45 minutes, wondering when the 102 minutes of running time would be up. This is not easy to watch, but if one doesn't enjoy Loden's writing or directing, one can certainly appreciate her acting, and I think she would have likely been nominated for an Oscar if the picture had been seen more widely in America. 
Her directing, on the other hand, leaves a little bit to be desired. Even with the help of cinema verite master Nicholas Proferis, one or two scenes are hopelessly underexposed. And there's a scene in a field in which Norman gets drunk that goes on for at least a couple minutes too long. Although it cannot be universally digested for both practical and aesthetic reasons, the film nevertheless stands as a landmark in the history of women in film, as its subject matter and history make for compelling stuff, especially in today's political climate. That's all I have to say about Wanda. Tune in next week when I talk about 1957's Mother India, directed by Bumbub Khan, in the meantime, feel free to email me any questions or comments at 1001moviespodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at 1001moviespc and look for the podcast's Facebook page. Until next time, happy viewing. <laughs>